You are listening to Fanfa Tracks. Because of the following special program, Wonder Woman and the Incredible Hulk will not be presented this evening. Star Wars news in a single file. This is Making Tracks. Here are your hosts, Mark Newbold and Mark Bolcaster. That's not true. That's impossible. Greetings, exalted ones, and welcome back to the final Book of Boba Fett reaction chat brought to you by those skug holes over at fanfatracks.com. Before we go any further, this is a spoiler-filled discussion, so if you haven't seen Chapter 7 of The Book of Boba Fett yet, then you may want to pause this podcast and come back once you have. You have been warned. So, if you remember, in a jam-packed Chapter 6, From the desert comes a stranger. We caught up with Marshall Cobb Banff of a newly renamed Freetown as he starts his own one-man war against the Pike Syndicate. Mando travels to an unknown planet where he's met by Ahsoka and and passed on a set of chainmail Beskar armour for Grogu, who was training with Luke Skywalker. But it became very apparent to both us, the viewer, and Master Luke that Grogu had such a strong attachment to Mando, it became difficult for him to fully embrace for Jedi training. Returning to Tatooine, Mando joins Boba's Council of War and heads to Freetown to raise a garrison with the help of Cobb Vanth. After agreeing to aid Boba, Cobb Vanth and his deputy are gunned down by Cad Bane, who is sent by the Pike Syndicate to persuade Vanth not to take up arms against him. And in a double blow, two Pikes leave a canton of explosives in the Sanctuary Club, killing everyone. Max Rebo's fate? Unknown. Back on the Jedi planet, Luke gave Grogu the chance to decide between setting aside his attachments for a Jedi life, or embracing them and returning to Din Djarin. What did the little guy goo do? <laughs> I thought it was funny in my head. So, that leads us nicely into Chapter 7, In the Name of Honor, with Robert Rodriguez returning for his third stab at directing The Book of Boba Fett. With a runtime of 58 minutes, this wraps up the seven-episode first season of The Book of Boba Fett. And to give us his first reactions, In the Name of Honor, is Mark Newbold. Mark, how's tricks? Tricks are good. Tricks are good. As I always say these days, insert audio clip of me saying everything's really busy and there's loads going on. But it feels like we're at the end of a little mini era today with the end of this season, this first season of Book of Boba. And I've been saying this on here and saying it on Fanta Tracks and saying it online and people have kind of picked up on that. I don't know if there's going to be a second season, but it just feels like this is the start, not just a wrapped up one one shot in and out job. It yeah. feels like we're going to get more, especially after the end of this one. It's totally teed up so much. All is good. How about you, mate? I'm very well, buddy. Yeah, I'm very well. I, I was kind of uh, sat there thinking about it earlier today. And, you know, first off the bat, I pretty much really enjoyed this episode. I was speaking to Karen on the way home and she was like, oh, what was the episode like? No spoilers. And so I was like, well, to be honest, I think it was fairly predictable, but it was a decent episode, really. When it, I mean, and I think if you do sit back, you could pretty much guess quite easily what was probably going to happen in this episode. Yeah. You know, but what I was, I was thinking was, on one hand, I think you could almost not return to a Book of Boba Fett, you know, named series. Mm. Uh, because kind of where the story kind of almost finishes, that is a conclusion. And I think maybe that's what they've done. We've concluded his story to a degree. So that if they don't get a green light for season two, then it's kind of left in a pretty solid state. I think Boba's initial story arc from, from his character perspective has been completed by the end of this episode. But, you know, in the general kind of Mando, Filoni, kind of like expanded universe of where we are now in Disney Plus streaming, it's set up stuff for season three and what have you. So it will be really interesting to see where things go. Would you like to see a second season of this? Or, or do you think, you know, one was really enough for what we got out of it in the end? Well, you make a good point in the sense that this has put Boba Fett back in the world because everybody thought he was dead in the Sarlacc. And we, we've kind of known for 40 years that he got out somehow. Now we've actually seen how he got out and how he recuperated to a point, you know, and how he got himself back into being the demo of Moss Esper and Tatooine and just being a player now. And we're going to skip around this episode like we always do. <laughs> yeah. By the end of this episode, thanks to Fennec Shand and her excellent assassin work, there's really no one in his way now. No. And I, and I just love the thought of you've gone through all this stuff. I mean, we've had seven episodes. The seventh episode was definitely a FET episode. The first four were definitely FET episodes. Chapters five and six mm. were Star Wars episodes. Mm -hmm. That speaks to what you just said, in that if they do more, it might not necessarily be the Book of Boba Fett season two. 
But I think we will get continuations of the storylines that have been set up here because you end the whole scenario, the whole storyline with Fett in control of Mos Espa and generally tattooing. You would imagine he has a good handle on most of it and basically goes, I'm not sure if this is for me, which just felt... <laughs> It just felt like the, like the punchline at the end of a comedy sketch. It made me laugh out loud when he said that. I was like, oh, you're kidding me. We've gone through all this. You've ridden a freaking rancor, for goodness sake. I put a tweet out the other day where I basically said, does anybody else think the last chapter of Boba Fett season one will be the live action connect Star Wars we always dreamed of seeing but never got? And I said it half in jest. Yeah. Kind of want to see him ride the rancor. And it was literally Star Wars Connect come to life, wasn't it? Absolutely, you know, yeah. this whole chapter. Well, and, yeah. and do you know what? The funniest thing I said to um, I said to Phil Parker after I saw the episode, after I got wind that he had seen it, I was like, I tell you what, now's the time that Haslam put out a rancor. You put out that rancor with a Boba mm. Fett that can ride on the back of a rancor or a Banffer, totally. and then everyone's yeah. happy. You know, <laughs> it's just like totally agree. You, you are know, so right. Yeah, you know, it's, I mean, so yeah. but yeah, I mean, so I mean, so generally, the criticism that I had with this episode was. I think it's just a shortcoming, possibly, of maybe, like, again, like we said, maybe the TV budget, because the action always felt a little bit slightly small, but I think it's, I suppose, also depends upon what you're comparing it to. You know, the problem is we only really have those massive epic battles that we saw in the Clone Wars, really, as a kind of like a yardstick, and also the, yeah. you know, the, the battles that we saw in Endor, for example. And that was, you know, that was fairly big and obviously a feature film kind of budget. There were parts where I was thinking, but doesn't really feel like, there's that many pikes and if you know if it was me in control of those pikes i probably would have just shock and awed and just kind of got them overwhelmed with numbers rather than drip feed in 10 or 15 at a time really that would be my you you made a good point earlier and we were conversing before we sort of set up the time to record this you said something earlier about i'm paraphrasing what you said but you basically said do you think Filoni's over his Western phase now? Because really, this is very much a Western, isn't oh, it? This, yeah. The previous couple of episodes, they totally had that Western vibe. And I think the, the construction of this episode yeah. felt like it still sat within that template of bunkered up in the relic of a building somewhere and everyone's coming in on them. And it's the last stand. Amanda and, and Fetter at one point are basically going to do a Butch and Sundance and run out just the two of them. It was that kind of fit until the, the mayor's assistant sort of stands up and comes up with his great idea. And as soon as he didn't read the pad, I just said to Ruth, Die Hard 3. Yeah. He hasn't read the placard, no. you know? It's that kind of thing. Yeah. So there were so many little moments when they telegraph certain things, like the Rancor, you know, the, the whole entrance of the Rancor was just brilliant. Mm. Just yeah. brilliant. When those droid car, when he saw the scanner, I was like, that looks like a droid car. But it wasn't, of course. It was these great big sort of walking gun machines, which I'm sure have been seen before. I couldn't place them, but they feel like they're familiar. They, they, I think they are very similar to the um, like some of the heavy artillery that you do see on the Battle of Geonosis, which I believe yeah. it might have even been with Republic, you know. I can't remember. Looking at our guide, obviously, uh, Sander does our guide, and he noticed that they were called Scorpinek droids, okay. as Pelly called them, Scorpinek droids. Mm. So no, they've not been seen before, but they're definitely inspired yeah. by stuff we've which, seen before. Which makes perfect sense, really. You know, you, yeah. you take old Republic tech and you refine it, and then, you know, somebody like the Pikes come along. I, I guess, you know, they've got a uh, close working relationship with a Trade Federation, if it was a Trade Federation weapon. And, uh, yeah, they just nick it. And we had people kind of going, oh, just use a jetpack, just use a jetpack throughout the whole of the season. And then you, you don't just get one jetpack, you get two jetpacks. And yes. those guys know how to kind of fight. And what was really good about it, was they, they know how to kind of fight together as well. It's like there was yes. a really strong synergy between them, which I just thought was was awesome. And you kind of think that's the kind of stuff that you, you shouldn't really get that kind of level of uh, synchronicity from two people who've only really met a couple of times. It was, it was awesome. Hey, this is Daniel Jose Older, and you are listening to Fanta Tracks. That's a good observation, though, because I thought exactly the same. They were covering each other's six and they seemed to know each other's styles. And clearly, Bobber was like, you don't believe in that rubbish, do you? Amanda's like, well, I do. Yeah. And Bob is like, well, I'm glad you do, because otherwise you'd have gone. Yeah, exactly. so, you know, I'm here. Yeah. I'm here for the long haul. If I die, then I die, because that's the creed. That whole exchange is really cool. They, they work really well together. And I'm so pleased you mentioned the jetpacks, because we know Mando can fight, and he's a smart fighter. And he kind of knows when to back off. Yeah. And there's a little bit, there was a moment here when that uh, Scorpionic droid had pretty much got him done. He thought he was done again. Mm. And it reminded me of season one with the Mudhorn. Yeah. When he's just there with the knife and he's like, he just puts his head down like, I'm done, I'm done. 
and Grogu comes in and saves him. And it felt like a flashback to that moment because he, you know, he was there. He puts his arms in front of his face like I can't get away now. I'm, I'm kind of screwed. And that best goal will protect him to a degree, but it wouldn't protect him from that. No, you know. And then again, there's the save. I think that's when the rancor came in, wasn't it? Lots of cool bits. It was great to see Pelly again as well. Didn't expect to see her get involved. So I know so that, that was pretty cool just to see her actually getting down a mucky. And you kind of expect, you know, any woman who's going to shag a jowl is going to have a, a blaster <laughs> and is going to be willing to fight for her town. So, you know, good on her. I thought that was awesome. And I think the one thing for me was the rancor probably would have been better if possibly we'd seen a bit of training because it, you know, we, we had that, it was an episode three mm. or four where it's like, you know, I'm, I'm going to ride this rancor and then, you know, have machete kind of saying, you know, it takes a lot of training and all that cut to two episodes time when we had a lot of training of other people. And, uh, mm. you know, you kind of think, well, maybe, you know, from a, a, a purely Boba centric storyline, maybe we could have got a bit of Boba training to ride Rancor a little bit. That could have been quite fun. Obviously, it spoke back to what the armorer said in chapter five, you know, about, oh, the, the one that will kill the 20 and ride the Mythosaur, that whole yeah, exchange. Yeah. So it, I think we said back on the reaction chat then, it like, that feels like it's got to be fair. And Mando did get on the back of it and didn't last very no, long. he didn't, did he? He's not a natural at this. I mean, he struggles with the blurg, but fair to a point. I mean, of course, there was that moment, you know, when the Rancor got hit, I think he got hit with the fire, didn't he? And the lurch back mm. and... Fett lost his balance, but he didn't lose control of the Rancor. He just lost his balance and quite obviously didn't have quite enough time to, you know, activate the jetpack to sort of land better than he did. So all of that was fine in a sort of a combat scenario, but it's a throwback to the holiday special, isn't it? When you first see Fett riding that creature, that's the first time we ever saw Boba Fett was on the back of that thing, chronologically. I mean, we saw Empire before we saw that in the UK, but you know what I'm getting at. You know, and now to, to throw back to that was the really neat touch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Rancor, I think, is probably, for me, the highlight of his episode because he had, he had the whole mm. kind of King Kong thing of him kind of climbing up the tower and stuff, and obviously he wasn't swarmed by aeroplanes and tanks and stuff, but, you know, he got up there. And, you know, speaking of Mando's Beskar armour, it, it actually even protects him from the teeth of the Rancor, which is just pretty neat and that. And I just find it ironic that they talk about wanting to save a town and and not wanting to pikes are going to come and destroy it and what do they do with a rancor they absolutely level the place i thought <laughs> it was just like <laughs> well yeah but yeah. yeah then actually at near the end when they're all walking through and they're all kind of like saluting boba and that and you know there's these old boys and that struggling to lift up these rocks and that and everybody's kind of thankful for him you know and you know which is kind of like nice so it's mission accomplished but it was great i think just generally how they kind of set up everything. So you had everybody taken down, but then when they came together, they coalesced. Mm. A bit like with Mando and Boba, you kind of saw it, saw it with the mods and the free towners who were kind of like helping each other. And Mando goes out and basically pulls back Santa when he's kind of hit and stuff like that. So everybody's kind of got that overlapping armor, armor from like one another rather than necessarily from the Beskar, which I thought was yeah. kind, kind of like a nice touch because you kind of have that, that one little exchange between the mods and the free towners about. I can't remember what they said exactly. Some city folk and desert folk, yeah, sort of exactly. Thing. And yeah. you kind of think, yeah, but technically speaking, you're all desert folk because you're on a desert planet in the middle of nowhere. So it's not like you're in the cosmopolitan kind of like center of like the galaxy. So I thought it was quite yeah, exactly. It's, it's it's not like the difference between the Gungans and the Naboo, no, is it? No, exactly. Yeah. But you know, they are closer, and I think that that kind of shows the fact that they kind of work together. And, and that was quite a nice little mini story arc between the two girls getting it together and getting up yeah. onto the, the roof and sniping those guys and stuff but you know right near the top i thought out of everything the one interesting conversational point which probably would possibly lead on to a second season is that exchange between boba and fennec because Mm. with fennec you kind of start to think that maybe she's she's you know she's feeling a little bit kind of held back yeah by boba this could potentially be this the start of like the seed that finally sees fennec try to overthrow boba that was my one take on that on that little scene the only thing i thought about that i totally agree because she did look irritated when he was no that's not how we're going to do it we're going to try this we're going to try that she wanted to go the more direct route which of course at the end she had the scope to go off and she bails the mods out of their scenario when they're cornered by the Aquilish. And then she goes off and does what she does right at the very end, which I kind of thought would be fit at the end. Well, but it turned out it. to be fit, which I really enjoyed. Yeah, I mean, that was, that was awesome. And seeing the mayor get hung like he did was kind of like, again, proper yeah. Western trope. But it's the second time I kind of almost think that Fennec was slightly more conspicuous by her absence because, you know, for most mm. of it, 
she's not there. And maybe she's not there because we've already seen just how good a shot she is. So if she was just up on, you know, on a rooftop, she would have taken out all those pikes at least. And that would have made it a lot less interesting. But also just thinking back, when Black Cassantin first takes on Boba in his sleeping chamber, I think we all kind of take it for granted that she's probably asleep as well at the other end of the palace and takes her longer to get ready, you know, into clothes and stuff to go and join the fight. But there's also part of me that kind of thinks, well, maybe this is all part of a bigger plan. And actually, this is mm. Fennec on a real subtle level trying to maybe find a way to get Fett to do the hard work or the heavy lifting and clear out the gangs and stuff and, you know, make peace and then maybe usurp him later on. But don't you think that we both picked up, well, it was, it was, he said it, you know, maybe this isn't for me, but he's taken Mos Espa and Tatooine back. The people are clearly grateful that they're not going to become a spice planet like Kessel or anything like that, or just have this trash run through them the way they have. They've been protected by their Damo. They've probably not had that since Jabba. You know, Jabba was, was harsh, but it, it always read to me anyway, as sort of reading it, is that he was kind of fair he wasn't sadistic for the point of being no. sadistic, yeah, but you, you look at Bib Fortuna yeah. and you think he was just a fat, lazy shit, wasn't he? He didn't really care well, about the Well, he didn't people. get it. I think he didn't no. get it. I think he just didn't kind of understand what Jabba was doing. He sees the spoils and the high life of that, what Jabba's afforded, but doesn't actually see or understand yeah. what's going on behind what Jabba's doing. What I'm thinking now is if they do push on to season two or this storyline because goodness knows, season two Mando storylines came into Book of Boba Fett, so why mm. couldn't a season one Book of Boba Fett storyline well, turn up in one of the other exactly. shows? Exactly, yeah. Is that Fett does say to Fennec, look, this ain't for me, but it probably is for you. Yeah. Do you want to become the Daimo of Tatooine? We've sorted this out. We've agreed to work together. There's no life debt here. They've thrown their lot in with each other by choice. But if Fett says to her, you know, you run this, Okay, I'll run that. I don't know, I'm just spitballing, but it just feels well, like there could be something yeah, in that. Exactly, yeah. I mean, remember that that meal scene they had and like mm. she's there, you know, enjoy it. Enjoy the enjoy, enjoy the spoils. spoils. And yeah. and he's like, yeah. I'm all right, love. You know, if you want to get fat then off you go. But it yeah. there, there yeah. possibly could be. For everything in one location. Daily news, reviews, interviews, podcasts, video and social media feeds. Bookmark Fanthatracks.com for Star Wars News 24-7-365. We've kind of seen this full story arc of Boba, you know, where he's kind of realised that there's more to life and hunting. And, mm. But you also wonder if he could just stay or if he's going to get restless. Well, one of the thoughts that occurs is that he settles that big score with Cad Bane. Yeah. I didn't really expect that to happen no. in this episode. I'm, I'm glad it did because we know as longer viewers that there's a big history mm -hmm. between Cad Bane and Boba Fett. Newer viewers will just go, wow, last week everyone was going nuts about this cool and new now he's dead. sort of gu gunslinger <laughs> guy, and now he's been run through with the gaffy stick. Yeah, he had Fett bang to rights, and it was cleverly played that it looked like Fett was done when he knocks the helmet off, and Fett almost looked like he was done. Yeah. And that felt like the law to Cad Bane, because then all of a sudden Fett gets the upper hand with the gaffy stick and doesn't mess around, just finishes him. We've had moments, no doubt we've had moments, but this really felt like, not that it matters, because this is a new guy. We've said this so many times on the show. After his experience, he's a new guy, essentially. But this felt like the old fighting fet. Yeah. And I just get the feeling that he enjoyed being that guy again. Yeah. Even though he's changed, his morals have clearly changed, his MO has changed. Nobody in that town would have gone within a mile of Fett. And you can't tell me that all of them don't know who he is. He was Boba freaking Fett, and they live in on Tatooine, where Jabba the Hutt was based. They're going to know who Fett is. He would be as infamous to them as... The Cray twins are to us. You know, he's like a legendary underworld character. Yeah. They'd be aware of him, but it just felt like something had got reignited. I think so. And it was, there's that quite fitting duality in, in respects that Cad Bane brings up Django. And then you find that both mm. Django and Cad Bane end up dead in the sand. The choreography overall in this series for me hasn't really set my world alight. None of the fight scenes have really, for me, felt like they've come together. But that last bit with the gaffy stick felt like the slickest I think we've seen. And I think they, they must have spent a yeah. bit of extra time to make sure that it, you know, there was no other option of that. And, you know, fair play to him because it's not like they shied away from showing him getting impaled on the gaffy stick, which is cool. No blood, mind you. But um, hey ho, you know, we can't have everything, I suppose. But it did feel like this episode was one of those that had a bit of everything. 
at the end with Mando and Grogu. You know, Grogu turning up in Red 5 was lovely. That was fantastic. That shot flying over mm. um, Mos was great when obviously it lands at Pelly's docking bay. That was fantastic. And obviously most people, me included, kind of expected Luke's head to pop out. But no, there's R2's flown in there. There's Grogu in the cockpit. So that was really nicely done. And taking him to Pelly as well was a nice touch because obviously you knew that she cared about the little green guy. So that was well played. All of that was well done. And bringing him into the story, the, re- the reunion between Grogu and Mando was really nicely done. It was a bit of an understated moment considering what you were yeah. probably expecting, I think. Considering they're in the middle of this massive sort of brawl, Mando's clearly, as much as he's ever going to give away, thrilled to see Grogu. And Grogu was thrilled to be back with him. And it's neat from a story point of view as well. It felt like another clever episode in that they've satisfied the plot threads from what we've seen in the previous sort of six and a half episodes. But then they've also teed us up for what's coming next. And of course, we've got to remember as Star Wars fans, what's coming next is nothing to do with this time period, no. really. It's going to be Kenobi, which is 10 years before Star Wars. It's going to be Andor. That's five years before Star Wars. It's Bad Batch. That's not that long after the end of the Clone Wars. We've got all of them before we get season three of of The Mandalorian, which will presumably continue this. So we've got a bit of a wait now, haven't we? We have. And that's the thing, obviously, the way they've left it with uh, Mando and Grogu in the N1, there's no mission. They haven't been sent on a quest like they were at the end of season one of Mando, you know, so that it can go anywhere. And obviously now we, we know that Grogu is going to stay with the Mandalorian. That's not, I don't think, going to be in question anytime soon. I was kind of almost expecting that at the end for final post-credit end scene, other than I didn't get my Banthers and my baby Banthers maiden and all that stuff. Um, That's true. Like a Moff Gideon cameo, they might have set something up like a big bad or another big bad for, for season three, but they've, they haven't done that. The only thing they did was they gave confirmation that Cobb Vanth is still alive to a degree and obviously going to probably end up with, I guess, a, a metal shoulder or a metal arm or something, you know, a cyborg arm, yeah. you know, so. I'm glad we saw that. I'm, you know, the, the weak weight guy, Tanty sort of said, yeah. he was gunned down and made it feel like he was dead, but I don't think any of us really Really nah. thought that we've seen enough online this week freeze frame shots of him getting hit in the shoulder that's not going to kill him so we sort of knew that wasn't the case you know i guess it would have been cool to have had a post-credit sequence and you know that reveal of luke was so nuke going off in the fandom you know at the end of season two mando to try and match that would have been near impossible mm, exactly you know yeah. there's only two other characters that could have introduced that they could have hoped to match that and it's it's that sort of five years after jedi solo character or a five years after jedi leia don't think we're quite there yet for the for the leia version of that happening hopefully one day but not yet and solo it was a lot of rumors i'm kind of glad Me now too. in the scheme of things that it didn't happen yeah. save that for another day if you're going to do it well exactly and also i think if they try to do it at the end of a the season then it feels like you were just trying to you yeah. know match if not surpass mandalorian and at least for me anyway i think i don't think anybody unless it was darth vader or darth frickin maul coming back at the end of this season you know was anything going to surpass probably how we felt when we saw luke that last time i just don't think that's that's likely i think that's one of those things a bit like the yeah. the end of that first ever chapter of mandalorian it's just one of those reveals that once you've done it don't think you can do it again without people feeling like it's just a comparison a lesser one at that but that being said you know i felt satisfied it kind of wrapped stuff up i kind of actually even by the end of it didn't mind the mod so much yeah the more you kind of watch them the more you accept them in the environment and i think that's True. just one of those kind of things with star wars is actually because you can kind of go well there's nothing about them that isn't star wars really Okay, maybe the scooters, maybe. But like in yeah. them as a character design, really, there if there's nothing about them that isn't, it's just like looked so out of place because we're used to desert farmers and and kind of wraiths and strays and in, in Tatooine. So seeing somebody completely different doesn't work. But then you start to look at some of the actual more character designs, and you can go, well, I can see where you would fit in in a different planet, and that's the whole point. So. I think by the end of it, and the fact that they could all shoot pretty well, most of them did bite the bullet in the end, the fact that you know some of them survived and seemed to be decent shots and stuff and pokey little blasters, I thought was pretty good. We've just had like a season two ending of The Mandalorian, which was like mind blown, and we've had lots of revelations in that all along. So to have something a little bit more meaty in respects of like, it's just a steady, gritty kind of feel is going to make you, in fairness, feel satisfied, but not necessarily like you've just spent your load and you're recovering for five minutes. It's a different kind of vibe, but it doesn't necessarily mean that this isn't as good as anything that's come before. They could be chasing the tail by trying to up what they did at the end of season two, Mando, for example. I think they did that in their last two episodes within the Book of Boba Fett. So this episode was, let's tie off all these plot threads 
Fett has been betrayed by the other gang leaders within the city. That's now dealt with. The Pikes in this part of the galaxy, they're dealt with. We know the Huts are in play again because you saw the twins, the cousins. That's out there now. Fett's not really contested anymore. He knows the truth of the Tuscan massacre. You know, there's lots of little things that got resolved in this one. But again, like you say, feels teed up to push forward. And you're right about the mods. I wasn't madly keen on them. It didn't really light my fire, but I never felt like they didn't really belong. It's like you say, it's a Star Wars galaxy, you know, back to the cantina in 77 and look at the eclectic mix of characters in there. You know, why would a stick insect look right next to a wolf yeah, sort yeah, of thing? Yeah, totally. They put their necks on the line. I mean, Cassantan did a shift. Yeah. I thought he wasn't going to... When the Trandoshans attacked, I thought, he's done. Yeah. You know, and then he come walking around the corner and then the sniper started popping shots and I thought, oh, no, he's, now he's done. You know, and then he gets hit by that Scorponek droid. I thought, now he's done. And he kept going. That's a proper tank character. So I <laughs> yeah. enjoyed that. And I really hope that we see more of him. That's not just he's done his bit and off he goes yeah, somewhere else. I and, think he's. I think know. he'll be a returning character. I mean, he is possibly a little bit OP. He did take a lot, and I just think there was some convenient blaster hits all to those sh- uh, those shoulder pauldrons where he's got uh, like quite a few. Yeah. And it's just like he's a big guy, so to just get the same area just felt a little bit convenient. But hey, I mean, he's cool. So hopefully, you know, we we see him again. And that's the thing: somebody like him will get paid or whatever by Boba and might just be on his way, and we might yeah, s- job by job. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Just go and yeah. see him. He, It'd be a job in Bounty Hunter, and so we probably could, you know, run him to him in Mandalorian season three. And that might yeah. actually be he is working for like Moff Gideon or somebody else against Din Djarin. And, and it will be that whole kind of thing that we've talked about all along, which is like, it's just business, it's nothing personal, and I want to get paid. It could well be. I mean, they certainly left this episode or this season rather on a lighter note the end sequence with the yeah. fruit you know oh, where's my fruit <laughs> <laughs> it's like the end of a classic star trek episode in the 60s when cox but uh, cock when spock kirk and mccoy <laughs> all of the, yeah i'll leave that in when they all have that you know, their little silly joke at spock's expense you know and raised his eyebrow because didn't get the joke and then the camera pans off and they're <laughs> yeah, all yeah. laughing belly laughing yeah and it was a bit like that and then of course the bit with you know mando and grogu in the in the n1 do it again do it again sort yeah. of thing it was cute but it wasn't the ending I expected. And then, as you say, you know, the, the post credit with Cobb Vanth wasn't unexpected. The fact that, you know, yeah, it's probably screwed his arm up, so let's replace the arm. That didn't surprise me at all. Hi, this is George Mann, and you're listening to Panther Tracks. What do you think's next then? What do you what what's your gut feeling for what we're gonna get next from this sort of plot thread timeline moving forward? With Mando season three, I mean, we I feel like we haven't really had a satisfying conclusion to Bo-Katan mm-hmm. and the whole Mandalore arc. And I feel partly because he's talked about it, Giancarlo Esposito is coming back as Moff Gideon at some point. So, you know, we assume we're going to see that. But I suppose also the question is what comes first, that or Ahsoka? Uh, and I guess it's going to be Mando season three, but it could be Ahsoka, which could mean that, yeah, we're on the hunt for Grand Animal Fraud. It's frustrating exciting to not have all these kind of release dates lined up you know like with sometimes with like marvel you know when the next marvel film's going to come out so it's like yeah. you build up to the next one and then it's quite nice not really knowing it actually it means that it is kind of held back and it's a bit more exciting but what do you think what's your thoughts well, i think that you make a great point there and i sometimes think these release dates is more for the stockholders and shareholders than it is for the fans sometimes yeah it, i yeah. think so just a bit of reassurance That's it. yeah because yeah, it is nice to be surprised that we get a celebration or new york comic-con or san diego or whatever and somebody gets up and does a panel and goes oh by the way Next month, season three, Mandalorian. The room goes nuts. Room H at, at San Diego goes crazy or whatever yeah. it might be. That's kind of fun. You've got to resolve what happened on board the light cruiser at the end of season two. After Luke has gone with R2 and Grogu, we've got to kind of return to that moment. There's got to be some exchange. They've got to address the issue of the Darksaber because you know that Gideon's there. He's going to be poking and prodding yeah. and just trying to cause mischief because that's just him. We've got to work around Cara Dune situation, which is a tricky one because real world encroaches on that. Could just be a line, couldn't it? Just a line of dialogue. I don't know. They go back and they find Mayfeld. And then he kind of goes, oh, where's that Marshall? But you're hanging around with Dinja. And all he needs to say is, you know, she's tied up on Navarro doing Marshall-y mm. type stuff. Yeah. You, you are right to a degree. It probably does need to have some kind of 
in story resolution yeah. just to tie it up. And I, mean, I suppose it's done. I mean, even if it just goes, she's dead. Yeah. You know, yeah, that, they had that whole yeah. thing on, in that episode when a gun kept jamming, just kept banging the gun on the floor. And I'm thinking, that's going to yeah. go off in her face one day. This is before we knew all this <laughs> business had happened, sort of thing. Yeah. And also, Amanda and Grogu, you know, for the first two seasons of Mandalorian, the first season we're learning about this new world, but you know yeah, that, exactly. that Grogu's wanted by Gideon, and Gideon only really comes into it near the end of season one. And then season two, mm-hmm. he's the ever present threat, and he gets Grogu and he loses Grogu. And now Grogu's back with Mando and clearly made his decision to pick the chainmail over the lightsaber. Well, yeah. there's got to be some sort of a dressing of that from Luke's point of view because he's just setting up that temple that we see destroyed in Last Jedi so there's there's elements there that need at least looking at and the great thing is even though this isn't the Book of Skywalker or anything like that we know that we can hop to those storylines within the broader framework of other shows because it's exactly like you said the other week it's like but it's all Star Wars where else are they going to show us these things whilst we've got this platform to show stories we don't need much of an excuse let's do it so I think that needs touching on and also what are Grogu and Mando going to do next? It feels like what the armorer was talking about in Chapter 5 of Book of Boba, that's going to be addressed again. He's now no longer a Mandalorian. He's got to regain his honor. This whole thing about going back yeah. to the minds of, of Mandalore and all that sort of stuff. So maybe that's the quest that they go on in Season 3. But again, it's like you said, Ahsoka is clearly on the hunt for Grand Admiral Thrawn, who feels to me like he's going to become the Thanos of the Star Wars galaxy, certainly on television, as the big player that's going to cause the most trouble. Maybe that's the team upcoming, is that they've got to deal with him. If he's involved, Ezra's involved, you're folding in Rebels characters. So it really does start to escalate in terms of scope. Wherever they take us, I'm totally ready for it. Me too, actually, to be fair. I think whatever happens, whatever comes next, we'll be ready for it. And hopefully there will be a Making Tracks reaction chat so we can talk all about it. But I think, for now, that's all we have time for for tonight. But I'm sure the uh, Book of Boba Fett conversation will spill over into episodes of Making Tracks in the coming weeks. So uh, thank you very much for listening. But if you want to send us a question, comment, reaction or theory, you're more than welcome to. Uh, We'll read them out on the next episode of Making Tracks. So Mark, could you be so kind to let the good listener know how they can get in touch? The good listener? Just the one? Yeah, I can do that. I can do that. Yeah, the singular one. Thank you, whoever you are. Uh, If you want to be part of the action and stay updated on all the latest Star Wars news, visit PantherTracks.com or check out the free Grogu! Panther Tracks app through the App Store to follow us on your mobile device. You can reach out to us and send in your listeners questions by emailing radio at fanthatracks.com. Absolutely. Questions, thoughts, queries, theories, anything you've got, send them to us, we'll talk about it. Comment, like and share on any of our social media feeds at Panther Tracks and be sure to subscribe, leave a review, preferably a five-star one, on Amazon Music, Audible, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify or your podcatcher or smart speaker of choice. And as always, thanks to James Semple for composing the Panther Tracks intro, Adam O'Brien for our making tracks opening music and mark daniel and vanessa marshall for our voiceovers and at least for now for making tracks reaction chats that's me done brilliant i will catch up with you very soon my you friend will. so we can have the episode 127 of making exactly tracks. that i think it 127, is 127 yeah 127 so that's next so that will be dropping next week onto your streams on a tuesday but until then everybody else take care stay safe and may the force be with you Coming up next on Fantha Tracks Radio, it's Desert Planet Discs.